So welcome to everyone. This is a very wonderful occasion, and you can see Lee on our Friday evenings uh, with the draw that you represent. We have no difficulty filling a very important room. I, I just want to start my brief introduction by saying that um, a long time ago, I won't tell you how long, um, when I was a young lawyer, uh, living on the Upper West Side of New York, uh, representing those who were trying to exercise their freedom of assembly and freedom of speech um, in the various parts of New York, but particularly around a part called Morningside Heights, uh, I never would have dreamed at that time that I would eventually meet the president of Columbia, that in fact, in some cases, the people that I was representing were suing the president of Colombia. So, uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure I, I'm sure some things haven't changed. Uh, but it's it's really a, a, a great honor to bring someone whom I've admired for years uh, as a leader in in higher education to CEU. Let me just say a, a few words um, in introduction that are a little bit more substantive. Um, Columbia University, I think, as we know, and there are a number of Columbia graduates uh, here tonight, and there's much, okay, thank you very much, <laughs> excellent, very good. Uh, and there are many ways in which CEU interacts with Columbia on the faculty level and the student level, but I think we all know that Columbia is truly one of the world's great uh, international universities. and. It has become that under the leadership of Lee Bollinger. This has really been one of his signal achievements. There have been many others, I'm sure he would say modestly, but it's, it's in the last decade plus uh, that, that this has happened. And we've been talking a little bit about the future of international universities, and I know he will speak more about that, but um, we here at CEU are very uh, proud of the fact that we are really not an international university. We are a non-national university. In that sense, we are a university representing hundreds of nations, and we have no foreign students um, because we are all foreign students or foreign faculty. There is no dominant uh, nationality in our campus. And I like to think often that that represents to some degree at least a vision, if not a reality, of the future of higher education on the international sphere. What I think has been accomplished at Columbia, as I look at it and have been interested in it over many years and have also occasionally guest taught there, is that Columbia shares that vision. Columbia is a, is a very international institution, as I just said, and unlike other American universities that um, that are trying to build campuses, as they put it, overseas, uh, and develop, if you will, and I put this in a pejorative sense, meaning it partly that way, kind of colonial outposts of their own activity. Um, Columbia doesn't do that. And, and I think it's, it's a great tribute to its leadership that what it does is to reach out to a variety of international partners, engage internationally in many, many different dimensions, bring the world into the classroom, just as we do here at CEU, and bring the classroom out into the world. And I think on the scale that this happens, it's quite uh, remarkable. So uh, this, is, this is the Columbia that I know that I greatly admire. Let me say a few uh, things that are more specific about our speaker. Lee Bollinger is the longest serving, and I think this is an, a, a great a tribute to you, especially for me, who's also a university president, longest serving university president in the Ivy League, which means the elite and major institutions, including Harvard and Yale and Princeton and a variety of others. Uh, he has served since 2002, and I think it's during that time that much of this transformation that, that I've just talked about has taken, part, taken place. Um, he, he is particularly gifted, 
in many directions, but he's been very gifted in raising money for his university, which is a very important uh, talent at, at any university. I think he's achieved the largest single capital campaign in Ivy League history, some six billion dollars. I'm not sure I can count that high. And, uh, in seven years, and uh, that's, that's been remarkable. The way I can see that in very specific terms is as a frequent visitor to the Upper West Side of New York, um, which I once lived in, as I said before, the whole area has been transformed by uh, Columbia University, and it's been transformed by a lot of very successful development that's occurred in the university as a result of, of the leadership of, of Lee Bollinger. Um, closer to my field of expertise before I became CEU president, there are two things about Lee that I'd like to particularly bring your attention to. Um, he was a heroic defender and successful defender of the principle of affirmative action in the United States in a very important case in the Supreme Court. Uh, and in the U.S. context, affirmative action means something different from perhaps what one is thinking about it in an international context. But what he defended was just what we talked about earlier, the importance of tremendous diversity in education as a way of making education uh, all that it can be because so many different uh, places and people and, and, and backgrounds uh, can be represented. And he succeeded in, in a defense of that principle in the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, finally, uh, he's an expert in freedom of speech, and I know he'll have a little bit more to say about that tonight. Um, the global challenge of freedom of speech is, is serious. We here at CEU have just launched a new program called Frontiers of Democracy that we've been discussing, uh, which features the ways in which uh, issues of basic freedoms are under assault in various uh, circumstances in the world and are also to some extent being eroded and challenged from within. So we are looking at all the various points of view of that. My own story, and I'll end with this, is that one of my first cases, you probably don't know this, it was, as a lawyer, uh, a case involving the, the publication of the uh, Nixon tapes, the White House tapes, when President Richard Nixon was in office. Um, there was much taping that went on in his office, and there was a lot of information that was relevant to the, uh, the, the criminal process, which ultimately led to his impeachment, and he and his lawyers uh, tried to suppress that information, and, and I was pleased to be a very small part of a large team of lawyers uh, that successfully uh, presented the case for the publication of the White House tape. So having, having you as a speaker here tonight on freedom of speech is, is a very special element for me. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Lee Bollinger to CEU. Thank you. Uh, that was an incredibly generous um, introduction. I'm very appreciative, John. Wonderful to be here at CEU. This is a place that I have known about thought about, I mean, you're very famous uh, in the world for all the right reasons, uh, and uh, it's a thrill to be here. Um, I want to introduce my wife, Jean Mignano Bollinger, who is right over here, who is an artist, and um, uh, but also uh, has been very involved and very important in uh, the establishment of one of the things I'll talk about, uh, which is the the, the global center concept that we've come up with for how to uh, deal with uh, globalization. Safwan Masri is uh, right uh, behind Jean. Uh, Safwan is uh, the executive vice president for uh, the global centers and for development. Uh, Safwan is, uh, was in the business school um, uh, faculty and administration and uh, then uh, he and I and Gene were really uh, setting up a center in Amman, really came from the interactions with uh, Safwan. 
uh, and then from that, uh, the whole global center uh, concept. Uh, and so Safwan has led the global center in Amman. And uh, in the last year, uh, I asked him to take on the overall management of the global centers and development of them. He's been doing that. Um, you know, I, I really, um, I, I don't want to give a, a, a speech in a sense. Uh, there are too many things that I and we would like to learn from you uh, about how to think about the issues that um, I'd like to raise. So uh, I'll try to be fairly brief um, and uh, then open it up for questions and comments. I know that you, under John's leadership, uh, are thinking uh, deeply about what it means for CEU to be part of a of a world that is engaged in globalization. I mean, it's just a horrible word that we have to grapple with um, and figure out, and I'll maybe say something about that, but I know you're thinking about this, and, and so we have a potential partnership here in, in at least developing this idea, uh, if not a greater partnership, which I think is also possible. Um, so I, I have a particular way of thinking and talking about this, which I'd, I'd like to just say to you. Uh, and, and, but there are other ways uh, that people think about globalization, other ways people at Columbia are talking about it. So it's not, even though I'm going to give my view, uh, the way I express it, uh, I don't want you to think that this is kind of the Columbia view. It's, um, uh, it's my view. So I start from a premise. Um, I'm going to talk about globalization, universities, Columbia in particular, and uh, perhaps some about freedom of speech and press as an example, really, of this. So I start from a premise uh, that the world is undergoing uh, a very significant, I mean, incredibly significant set of changes that are in some ways revealed and in some ways masked by the term uh, globalization. That there is a phenomena, there are phenomena uh, that are in a sense independent of what is happening within countries um, and even collectively of all nations. There is a, there are phenomena uh, that we refer to as globalization, and again, beyond the reach of any individual nation and even a very powerful nation like the United States. And uh, these phenomena are principally about, uh, they have a kind of economic base, the opening of markets all over the world in the past uh, decade to two decades the reach of finance, of foreign direct investment, of a network of global uh, business activities uh, that are happening on their own. I mean, beyond the reach of, again, of any individual country. And then there's uh, the global communication system. So uh, we have something that is entirely new in human history. I mean, there's always been some form of global communication. And it's always been getting better, in a sense, or easier to communicate globally. But the internet is something altogether uh, of a different order of magnitude uh, than anything we have seen before. And you put into that satellite transmission, television, uh, uh, and a few other things, and, and you have a a new way for people to interact, for knowledge to be um, shared, developed, but also bad things that are happening. And none of, I mean, this is a, 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 this is a technological thing, and good things and bad things uh, can happen on it, just like with markets, good things and bad things can, can happen through it. But you combine those two things which are really extremely new in human, in modern history. Uh, and you add into that things like the ease of travel, 
and the number of people who are uh, leaving their country, uh, their country in which they're citizens, the number of students who are moving around the world, so the ease of and the numbers of people, you put all these things together and then some other things, and it's, it's something entirely new. Um, so I, there are people who say what I've just said uh, from their own vantage point. I'll give you two examples. So one is Daniel Bethlehem, who was the, in the um, uh, legal counsel for the foreign minister, um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, of Britain under the Gordon Brown administration. He's now visiting at uh, Columbia Law School. I'm sure many of you uh, know Daniel Bethlehem. So I, he wrote a piece in the last year. Same thesis. Uh, somebody who's practiced international law, who is part of the international legal system, who um, uh, is a theorist of it, a, and he writes an article that says, there's a new thing happening in the world. Uh, he cites all the things that I just cited. Um, markets, investments, money, uh, communications, uh, ease of travel, and so on. And he uses the metaphor of nations are now like rocks in a stream, which I find quite illuminating. Uh, this is happening. These things are happening. And nations can affect it. They can take the flow of these activities. They can slightly divert them. They can move them. They can interrupt them. But the stream keeps going. And his thesis then is, if you take all of international law and you think about its origins and how these institutions have been developed that are uh, international, are great international institutions, they were created in a world in which the nation state was not a rock in the stream, but was the, the stream itself, or the, that's where things, and of course there have always been things happening apart from, uh, but this is, again, the level of magnitude of this is incredible and significant. And it calls for a whole new way of thinking about the development of international law, international legal principles, and international institutions. And, of course, the, he goes on a little bit beyond that, because the natural question is, well, exactly what should happen next? And he sort of leaves us as we all do. I mean, that, when I think about freedom of speech and press, which I'll get to in a moment, that's the point where I stop. Well, so what should happen next? And we don't know. But we have a world that we've created that is not suitable for the reality that now exists. Uh, another example is, uh, is Pascal Lamy, whom I've gotten to know over the past year. And Pascal articulates this in his ways, former, of course, the vantage point of having been the head of the WTO, somebody who has dealt with a, from a, a, the world from a world viewpoint. And his view is, uh, International trade, trade between countries, international commerce has been something that, you know, you put a tariff on bicycles, we put a tariff on washing machines, let's trade, you know, to a world in which you have a global company like Google and one continent says, let everything go. I mean, we'll let it all come out. That's our principle. And another country or group of countries or regions says, wait a minute, we have a different view about a value here. It's not a tariff on bicycles. It's we believe human beings need more privacy than you are allowing. And we're going to have a principle of the right to be forgotten. And in the United States, I mean, in a free speech, free press context, the right to be forgotten is just completely inconsistent with the way we've developed it. And in Europe, not to have some kind of rights of privacy or some sense of the right to be forgotten is, you know, 
that's just not what the modern world can live with, the kind of exposure of the individual human being in that way. So, so you have a confrontation of values. That's how extensive the international uh, uh, sort of commerce has become. And we need a way of developing an understanding of what's happening, but we need a way of dealing with what are our shared norms? And do we have, and, you know, how do we figure that out? It's not bicycles and washing machines. So those are two examples from people that I find completely, you know, I'm in total alignment with them. Then you have somebody uh, like Mark Mazower at Columbia, uh, of course, an eminent historian, and um, uh, all of you uh, know Mark personally or by his writings. And, and Mark and I and a group of us uh, have been talking about whether the disciplines, whatever discipline you pick, law, economics, political science, history, et cetera, really have to be rethought in light of this new kind of phenomenon. OK, and that's where I sort of want to, to go. So um, my premise is uh, for leading a great university and for my own work and for understanding that there's this kind of new thing in the world. It's very recent. And uh, it poses all kinds of problems. We know many of them. I mean, we, climate change, the effect on the world's natural resources, uh, issues of uh, economic regulation. I, I sat on the board of the New York um, Federal Reserve Bank uh, from January 2007 until uh, January uh, almost uh, two years ago. So I watched the crisis, you know, I, one of my one of my personal lines, I've got a personal line about PowerPoint, which is that I, I, my, one of my goals in life is to die without ever having done a PowerPoint presentation. And I succeeded again today in avoiding that. And another one of my lines is that never appoint me to a board because uh, I was appointed to the New York Fed board, as I said, in January 2007, and the world was perfect, absolutely <laughs> perfect. Everything was just going amazingly well. And then by August, the whole world fell apart. Uh, the other board I've set on is the Washington Post board. Uh, and you know that went from it's a world flourishing for the press to you have to sell Newsweek, and now you have to sell the Washington Post. But one of the things I learned in that experience was we do not understand. We do not understand the people who, who are responsible for the global uh, system of banking and finance do not understand how it works. They do not understand the network effects. They can tell you how a bank looks. They can tell you this, but as, as Ben Bernanke has said, they did not realize if Lehman went out of business that that would have a consequence in Europe that would redound to almost bankrupt Ford Motor Company that would, this is a super, super complicated. So we, we know that there are problems, uh, some of them we, but some of them we don't know. So Pascal Lamy says, and I really love this, we do not know what effect globalization, these things we're referring to, are having on individual people, how they're thinking, what they, uh, what do they experience? How are their lives different? We do not understand basic things about this, and until we d arrive at these understandings, we're not going to make very much progress. So my view is a great university needs to attend to these things, needs to focus and, on them. And then I go through a whole bunch of, of factors. Um, just like the world has, that we have now is, was set up largely after the Second World War, the institutions we have, the, so has academic life. The subjects that we teach, the disciplines we have, the, the ways in which we organize expertise has been set up in a world that was right 
for that world from the 1950s and 60s and 70s. But it's not right necessarily for this world. So again, one of my lines is, I'm a First Amendment scholar. I'm the first generation of First Amendment scholars. There are no First Amendment scholars before me and the others who were in my generation. Zachariah Chafee, okay. You can point to one person in the 1940s. People like me were created in the 1960s. Before that, there was no First Amendment scholar. It was constitutional law. It was a small subject called American constitutional law. But it became so important in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, that the field was created. And I became a First Amendment expert. I know nothing about the Second Amendment, the Third Amendment, the Fourth Amendment. I know everything there is to know about the First Amendment. There are people in the 14th Amendment, people in the 9th Amendment, people in the 4th Amendment, people in you know, separation of powers. And that was a good reshaping of American intellectual legal disciplines and expertise for that period and into the 80s. It's no longer right for today. No American law school should have three people, excuse me, like me teaching freedom of speech and press or media freedom, and many law schools have that. This came on, on its own or the... Yeah. the <laughs> Yes, right. <laughs> Please amplify, you know. Um, so we need, well, we need uh, people who are working on these problems that are very important today, not the problems that were extremely important. We still need them, but we don't need them as much. So the second thing that is uh, difficult uh, is that we don't even have, in many ways, the basic human experiences, and I mean simple human experiences, on which to build the kind of expertise we need. And I, my, you know, an example is how few American academics or intellectuals have traveled ever to China. And I don't know how you think about the modern world without having set foot in China. I mean, I just don't know how that really happens. And that's not their fault. It's that in order to do the things we need to do, given where the world is and this new phenomenon, you have to help people have the most basic kinds of experiences, life experiences on which you can then build the kind of knowledge that you need in order to address them. So in many ways, it's like we're starting from scratch. And then I'll say lastly, but among these things, that our model of dealing with problems is very much the single faculty member model, the, the, um, uh, the single investigator model. I write my books, you write your books. We'll talk, we'll meet at conferences, glad to work, maybe I'll co-author something with you. Great, but I write my books at the end of the day and I thank people. For this, there are examples of where this has changed. One is physics. It used to be that that was the way physics was organized. Now CERN and the problems that are being addressed require teams of hundreds of people uh, writing papers where there are hundreds of people on that it has to be a huge collective effort in order to be able to answer these questions. Another I see is climate change and the combination of earth scientists that are working on all these and come together. It seems to me we need more of that for the kinds of problems we're dealing with given the scale of them than we have. So now to go to the, you know, that's the big kind of picture and the, the critique, um, uh, what do we do about it? Well, you know, it's hard for a president, I'm, I know this is different for John, but to just go into a faculty member's office and say from now on, you know, you're not gonna write this book, you're going to work with these 10 people on this project. And so it's very hard to move things. Uh, one way to do that is to set up a branch campus. 
and to have a theory that your faculty will start going around to these branch campuses and your students will flow uh, around the whole system. Perfectly good theory. Uh, my view is that's not going to work. Uh, and it's not going to work because setting up those kinds of things are very expensive and the only place you'll end up going are places with a lot of wealth. Uh, you, it's not on, I mean, it's not unexpected that the branch campuses of many American universities are in Qatar, Abu Dhabi, Singapore. Uh, it's, it's where the money is. And uh, so that's a problem. Uh, the other thing is that what tends to happen in these situations, you get a separate faculty and a separate student body, and they actually don't interact. Uh, and so your main home campus is not affected. And my view is, given my theory, you really have to change the home campus. So we've done this. Let's set up a global a set of global operations. Um, they're centers. They're more or less buildings and uh, great people who run them, people who are like Safwan and Aman, or the former minister of mines under Bachelet in Santiago, or the former minister of agriculture in Ethiopia who's running the Nairobi Center. I mean, these are very sophisticated people. And then you start to try to get faculty and students to utilize these for projects, cooperation with local institutions, uh, working on real things. So they develop their sense of feel, their sense of experience. Uh, they work, and you shape it as a global network, not just go to Nairobi and see what it's like to work in, in Kenya or East Africa, but understand that this is part of investigating global questions. And we now have students and courses and projects and the like, and, and it's taking off. And I think it's going to be very successful, but we'll see. We still have a long ways to go. So then we have other things like the Mark Mazower project on rethinking the disciplines and, and a Committee on Global Thought, which is about theory, a group of faculty are interested in theory of, of globalization. And then, uh, of course, we have our schools, SIPA, which is changing itself uh, in this way, School of International Public Affairs, business schools working on this, public health. Of course, there's a lot of activity already, but it's, it's happening in a different way, I think. There is something about the magic of physical presence. Uh, you go to a place physically. You then, as I say, read about it. You learn about it. It's just incredible. Or you think, I can go there because and work on a project because we have facilities there. Last thing I'll say is uh, you know, free speech, free press is my example of, of how this should work. I still teach American First Amendment law. So I do it with undergraduates and um, have 100, 150 students in my class teaching it right now. Uh, I use the Jeff Stone, uh, Cass Sunstein uh, casebook, uh, used it all along. Nothing in there about global free expression. It's all American case law. I, I, I think there's now one note after one case which is an example of, of something in another country. And yet, we now live in a world where you say something in the United States and you can be sued for libel in Britain by a Saudi person who claims he's been falsely uh, charged with uh, being financing terrorism and a judgment can be recovered against you even though you don't show up. And then, you know, you better not go to London because the judgment can be enforced against you. Uh, and the heads of Google are under prosecution in many, many countries around the world uh, because, so it's a global communication system, but more importantly, in order for this global kind of system, this global thing that's happening to work and to be investigated, there has to be real global conversation. There's now a global public forum that's needed, just like in the United States we concluded a national public forum was needed. And there have to be norms about this, just like Pascal saying about world trade. Um, there have to be norms. Uh, and as Daniel Bethlehem says, there have to be institutions that are 
So this is a big thing, and the American First Amendment community is not paying attention to it, in my view. So we got to get it to pay attention. So that's an example. So I've set up something at Columbia uh, with Anya's uh, Calamard, who's former head of Article 19. Uh, I have done this with your colleague Miklos uh, uh, before. We've co-taught. The idea is let's start uh, trying to get more focus on what's happening around the world. So we've got a little project, and it's really tiny, but I love it. I mean, it's to me just what needs to be done. So the little project, uh, just I'll finish with this, uh, is to create a website where we will assemble as, all, as much as we can all of the judicial cases on freedom of speech, thought, press that are decided around the world all the time. We, so it turns out there are about 15, 20 per month new cases on free speech, free press around the world coming out of court system. And there are really some interesting cases. I mean, we're just getting started. We've got 150 to 200 that are now um, been synthesized and described and uh, commented on and they're up on a, this website. And, and we will uh, build up this database of a, of a global system of, of cases. And as I said, there's some surprising ones, a Zimbabwean constitutional court uh, striking down some legislation and uh, of course the, the, the constitutional court in Turkey striking down the restriction on uh, Twitter, but then there are some, oh, many bad cases. And when I became a law professor in 1973 at the age of 27, I was part of a generation, as I said, described, you know, we're going to be great scholars of this and that. We thought the former generation, which had spent all this time creating treatises in which they said, Corbin on contracts, we're going to, we're going to read all the cases on contracts in all the jurisdictions in the United States, summarize them in a treatise, and that will uh, we'll comment on the trends and, you know, in Idaho this is happening and this is the offer acceptance rule there, and, but it's different in Tennessee, but, you know, this is the new theory emerging. And I suddenly realized recently that actually was a way of creating a sense of a national law, which had been 48 separate jurisdictions before that. And that's needed now in a world community that is thinking about norms of freedom of expression. So if we can begin to collect this, we can then build teaching materials. Maybe here we will have uh, a joint course with Columbia on global free expression using the cases from around the world. There are no teaching materials now that we know of that uh, incorporate that. And maybe over time, and one of the great luxuries of being in a university is we can take the long view. Maybe over time, we can start to develop a sense of international norms where courts refer to e each other more often, where we can comment on the development of, of the law and actually create a, more of a sense of an international uh, system of uh, freedom of speech and press. But that's just one uh, of, of many. And, and so that's the, that's the theory for, that's how I see the reality, how I see where we are as universities, what we need to do as universities, and an example uh, from my own field. And I think it's appropriate to stop there. Thank you very much.